having us. So in case you haven't noticed and you want a Twitter reference here, this is at John M. Chu, and I am at Brian Seth Hurston. Isn't it interesting that that is our only identity that's necessary in, in this age? <laughs> it's on there. Oh, oh yeah. See, thanks, there Kevin. There it is. <laughs> See, you have nothing to say about your life anymore, right? <laughs> Everybody says it for you. Um, so, uh, oh, by the way, ign <laughs> ignore the tweets here right now. Yeah, that could be I, very I tweeted distracting. Out and I said, <laughs> tell funny <laughs> jokes with this hashtag. And uh, so there they go. Well, then, the, 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 in the truly pioneering spirit. A lot of Bieber fans out there. So we've decided that all we're going to do as pioneers is sit back and watch you watch that because they will learn more about you. Um, John, we were talking a little bit earlier, and I said to you, no one really sets out to be a pioneer. You kind of follow your heart, and then someone later determines that you are a pioneer. And here you are, a filmmaker. You've been making videos since you were a little kid. And um, you have a great USC film school education. <coughs> Trojans. And, um, but here you had a period that you were idle. Yes. Uh, you had a film that was in development at the time. It was Bye Bye Birdie. And, and your hands were idle. Is that where LXD came from? Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of where, um, you know, I'd done a, uh, I've been doing videos since third grade, um, whether it's like little animation with my toys or shooting my family on vacation and getting my brothers and sisters to do uh, scenes for me. Um, and, uh, and so there was a time, so I was always doing it through college and everything. And then what coming out of college, I, um, I, uh, I, I, did a short film that got a lot of attention, so I got attached to a bunch of movies coming out of college, uh, Bye Bye Birdie being one of them, and a couple others at different studios. And so I was getting paid to, you know, develop, which was really cool. But there, but you know, it takes time to develop. So it, it was a span of about three years where I just didn't make anything. I just developed these scripts with the studios, and and I, it was it was hard. It was the hardest. It was the longest period of time not making anything physically. Uh, in my life. Um, yeah. You as a filmmaker, more or less, were waiting for the film world to give you permission to get behind the camera and do your job. Exactly. I felt like I was like on the Lakers, but I was on the end of the bench waiting to get like my 30 seconds, one minute on, uh, you know, on, the, on the court. And so I, uh, there was a certain point where I was like, you know what, I just got to go, I, I got to take my camera, which had been you know, in the dust for a while, and I got to go shoot again. And so we started making these fun little uh, dance dance videos, uh, to and we challenged Miley Cyrus to a, to a dance-off, and that sort of started this whole... You know Miley Cyrus before you challenged her to a dance-off? No, I never met her. What she'd done, well, we'd just finished Step Up 2, so i just finished my first movie, and I knew that there was going to be a point of, like, I didn't have my next movie. Who knew how long it was going to take? But I wasn't going to have that three-year period anymore. Um, so I, uh, so th one of our young stars, 15-year-old Adam Savani, got a call from from uh, Miley when the movie came out saying, hey, I, I loved your movie, and she hung up, and she didn't leave her number. So he asked me, like, hey, how do I get her number? Do you have it? And I'm like, I don't know her, but we can't call her agent and get it. That's weird. So uh, I was like, Let's, she has a YouTube channel, um, and this is post-Twitter, no, pre-Twitter, post-MySpace. Uh, YouTube hadn't really blown up. It was just starting. I mean, it's been around, but it was just starting to get, like, sort of hit that critical mass. But... Uh, so she had a Twitter with her, fr or a, a YouTube with her friends. So me and him teamed up, and we challenged her to a dance battle. Got all our dancers together. We knew she had the resources to have as dancers and stuff. So about two days later, she responded with her own dance video, and at the end of her video, she included Channing Tatum, which is kind of a slap in our face because Channing is in the Step Up movie with us. So. Uh, so then we like I got a I got a boy from your team now. Yeah, exactly, top dad. Exactly. Exactly. So then we uh, started. We did another one, and we got our friends, and we got Adam Sandler, Diana Ross. We got um, a Chris Brown before all the incidents. Uh, we got uh, Amanda Bynes. We just got a bunch of people in the, um, that we knew, and uh, that video just took off and went crazy. And so what we saw was that the people at home. Uh, w one, were engaged just because it was dance and it was fun. They got to see a bunch of dancers. But two, oh, well, Miley as well. And three, that they could actually, they could root for us. They were saying, like, her, her audience was kind of growing older, so they were going against her. And then we call ourselves the Adam Chu Dance Crew because he was Adam and I'm Chu and Dance Crew. So we called ourselves the ACDC, uh, which got us in trouble later. But that's a whole other story. Um, 
So the ACDC then, people wanted to rep the ACDC at home in, in Japan or wherever they were from. So we made a little logo and said, you guys at home, like you guys can uh, make a video, put this logo on it, said I'm down with the ACDC. We sold a t-shirt with a company, Invisible Children, a, a non-profit that, that, um, that all the ch all the uh, Still LXD profits from sales of merchandise go to the, go to the organization. Children. Yeah. So and uh, so we raised over like a hundred thousand dollars from these ten dollar t shirts that people could make. It said, "I'm down with the ACDC," and they made these videos all around the world, thousands and thousands of videos, and then posted on her fan sites, on her YouTube page, and so it was in that drama that was really fun for us. That was real. That we, that I, me and my, uh, all the dancers kind of sat around and was like, this is really fun. What if you controlled both sides? Like, that would be, this is a story that's being formed by the users and by what we're actually doing. So, we, um, we actually talked to their dancers and, w and we're trying to get one of their dancers, like, you know, they don't know who you guys are. They're just paying attention to Miley. But if you come over to our side, you're going to be the traitor and you're going to get famous off of that. So, why don't you do that? And, by that time, she had her lawyers had stopped the whole thing because she wasn't allowed to do anything outside of Disney or whatever. Miley Cyrus is Miley no fun. Cyrus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then, but but that idea of like we if we can control this narrative, then we have something really interesting because it combines all the things that the web is great at. Um, so let's run the the video so that we can see a little of LXD because yeah. we just. So this came right out of it. that idea that what if we had the good side and the bad side and you could choose. So. We'll have to sacrifice our tweets while we're watching the art. From Wikipedia, all of the choreography and stunts are real. There are no special effects or wire work, and the entire series is shot on location without the use of green screen. Yes. So Absolutely. here you are. I mean, you did step up. You had a lot of resources at your fingertips. Then you discovered, you know, this is going to be made for the medium. Obviously, there was something organic. You saw the opportunity in the audience. You saw how dance already resonated with your audience, and you constructed a story with uh, villains and, and heroes with special powers that come through dance. And that looks pretty high budget with production values and stuff. And as we all know, when pioneers are out on the great frontier, they scrap things together and you know, you got an old tin can and, you, and some sticks that you rub to make fire. How did you make fire? Um, well, what kind of came out of the, the ACDC stuff was that one, uh, I was shooting all the ACDC stuff on my own camera by myself. What kind of camera? Uh, that was a Sony, uh, I don't even remember, the, it was an HDV little camera um, that I'd literally gotten just for those videos. So it was like. Was it a birthday present? No, just uh, kidding. For myself. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, so I sh and so once that was done, I was like, well, we have a b I had a friend who had a red camera and he had just gotten it. They were really excited. They're like, let's shoot some stuff. I was like, you know what? I don't want to shoot this stuff with my camera anymore. We have such 
high level of talent and and what we also found online was that people were attaching themselves to certain dancers. They're like, we want to see more of Legacy. We want to see more of Mad Chad. So they were making sort of heroes of the characters already and requesting more of them. So uh, so when my friend was like, I have a red camera, I was like, okay, cool. Let's get the old band back. And I called my friends who I went to school with who you know, at the time were like assistants or not really working or just kind of trying to find what to do. And I said, let's – I have this really fun idea we can – play and just see what happens it's for the web so uh w let's shoot four episodes to start and let's just see what happens and maybe we can get some support to actually uh, pay for the rest so uh we shot four episodes with all my friends from from college and all the dancers i knew and they were all everyone basically worked for free and we we're like let's but l we, we can't release something that looks like crap so let's let's make this really interesting and each genre each episode was going to be a different genre. So we were going to do a film noir. Uh, we are going to do sort of an Amblin-esque uh, fairy tale. Uh, we were going to do an action one and, and, and a comedy. Uh, so we shot these four episodes, uh, just us. And it was probably like 10, 11 people in our crew. We had to shoot each one in a day and a half. Um, and we just, the locations that we got were, were, were real locations, and we just had to make it make it look good so, so you know in the it's just talent that in the spirit stuff. here i mean you really you worked with what you had and um we were talking earlier about kind of a hallmark of your career is its organic nature it's like some directors set out to make something happen and just watching the the cinematography the editing and the shooting i, I want to talk a little bit about how you follow a dancer i mean i've never seen dance shot like that um, it is an um, it establishes an immediate emotional relationship between the audience and the dancer. Um, how do you shoot dance the, the way you shoot it? Is um, well, one we have an amazing cinematographer and, and and choreographers that work together from the very beginning when we first start to create these stories. They um, we have a dialogue all together, um, and so it's it's not a, a process that they come on later. It is from the very inception we, we're creating it. The other thing is I, I love movement. I think it's not even about dance because I'm not an expert at dance at all. Um, I'm not a dancer myself. I like to dance at weddings and bar mitzvahs. You'll see me out there, but I'm not very good. Um, but I love the idea that movement can communicate what a paragraph of dialogue could never communicate. When John Wayne sits on that porch or stands on that porch, you feel something. And when Sid Sharice takes off her jacket, you feel story, um, and it's, it's you know, when I watched Michael Jackson growing up, uh, he made me believe not in me wanting to be a dancer, he made me believe in magic. And so when I see these dancers, that's, they are poetry in motion. Their bodies communicate, when they're real dancers, their bodies communicate what the song is playing, um, and every move is to a beat in the song. Even if you can't hear that beat, they hear that beat somewhere. The dancers that aren't great are the ones that, if you change the music, they would do the exact same move again. They're just people who John, don't move. John, this is, so you talk about the creative team, but each one of these dancers, I mean, you really are able to capture the essence of their, I don't know what else to call it, but personhood, spirit, soul. Mm -hmm. um, so they're part of the collaboration as well. Yeah, I mean, a, a big part of it was just being educated of, there's hip hop, and there in within hip hop, there's like, you know, a hundred different dialects within that. There's, you know, you can crump, you can break, you can pop, you can lock, you can do a bunch of, all these things were different languages that they didn't even interact. The best locker never interacted with the best popper. They knew of each other, but they would never battle because just two different things. So once I got embedded into that way, okay, there's different skill sets for each of these things. And then when you go and shoot them, we learned a lot by like, with Mad Chad, he's our robot guy. His his brilliance comes in little movements, like when you're just standing there and it's just his finger or his wrist that's moving because he's telling you, he's revealing little things about what he's doing just through his little thing. And and when we had a camera coming in and zooming in and going around him, you lost the intimacy of just being able to stand there and watch his finger move. Um, and when we when we held the camera right there, suddenly that thing that you see in a room that amazes you can get translated through. And there's uh, also a duet between the camera and the dancer. So there's, it's, it's not just the choreography within the frame, it's of the frame itself. So we have, you know, if you have a b-boy who's doing a big spin in the air and coming towards you, his expression is that he's 
building energy up and exploding. So whatever way as a filmmaker's tool to, to help express that explosion. So we're going to counter him as he's coming towards us s and, and, and then come around him as he starts to spin around so you feel the weight turn. Um, those things are what we try to look for when we're shooting these is how can we be a part of the dancer's brain of what they're trying to express at that moment. It's, so. it's beautiful work. I, I want to shift gears and talk about the conversation with the audience. Um, so there are storytellers today, um, Tim Kring is one of them, Damon Lindelof, another, that actually establish and have a relationship with the audience, whether they talk directly to them or, or they take their considerations in. You are someone that actually collaborates with your audience. So there's some kid named Bieber, <laughs> some, some uh, you know, youth, and, uh, but his fans are very, very active and they're as loyal to you as they are to Justin Bieber. And you said to me once that you take their comments, their considerations, and you actually respond to them in recutting the film or showing them more of what they want. So you were in conversation. Can you talk a little about the conversation? Um, well, I love the fact that you know we're in a t day and age where, you know, as a filmmaker, I loved showing. I remember showing my first film to my family when I cut together a vacation video, and they were sitting there and they were crying watching their own vacation video. And I remember that's this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. That same thing that sparked that in my brain, uh, I think for a lot of filmmakers, th the idea that an audience can feel what you are trying to express is is like the ultimate. Uh, is, is the ultimate piece of satisfaction, especially when you've been working alone in a dark room editing or writing. So the fact that you now can have a film and release and then talk to your audience while they're watching the movie, which I don't always love, but that, but that, uh, you know, that they, what they experience after the movie or what they felt about it um, is such a different experience. And, and, and going into uh, the Bieber movie, the story didn't begin or end in the movie theater. The story started when Justin first tweeted my name and we made a video and he said, this is the director that's gonna direct the movie of my life. And suddenly I went from, I think I had 12,000 followers before to uh, the overnight that night I had like 40,000 followers and now I have like 250,000 just because of Justin sort of saying, this is the guy, the story starts now. And so I would have conversations um, with his fans over the course of making the movie. What what do you guys want in it? We want you know his hair flip. We want uh, shirtless Bieber, whatever it is. And um, I was able to give them like instant feedback. I could shoot the scene that we were shooting. I could shoot um, them in the audience. We told them if you come tonight, bring um, you know bring glow sticks, and they all brought glow sticks that night. Um, we told them to wear purple when you're going to uh, Madison Square Garden when we shoot Madison Square Garden because we were going to have have a helicopter. You tweet me your cross streets and we'll do a flyby. So we're up there and we're doing flybys uh, and uh, to get people in the streets all dressed in purple walking by. And that that conversation was not even possible before. Um, and so that relationship, and even I didn't understand that until going through it with Justin and realizing that these kids really did m get him there and that they are still a part of that. And that the, the once even once the movie showed, um, after it was done, people who were like, oh, we love that, but we want more of this. Where was, ch you know, his friends, Chad and Ryan? And so what we did, because we now, we were at like 90% uh, digital uh, screens, we could change the movie. So in two weeks, two weeks after it had already come out, we, um, we re-released the movie with 40 minutes of new footage of stuff that I was cutting four days before the release of that, which is absolutely nuts to have a wide release and not be done four days before. Um, and we shot the kids watching the movie the first weekend uh, in the movie theater and we included it in the movie. So it's this weird now the movie can talk back to the audience. You could always talk before you made the movie and you could make the movie, but all of a sudden we had another side of the conversation, um, Do which you is think insane. Uh, we, we have such a short time and so much, I mean, I'm, I'm, I find the way you approach your audience and the way you approach the art, um, it is a pioneer spirit. It is just jumping in both feet and, and taking the results. And I'm sure you've made mistakes, which we could talk about for another hour, because all pioneers learn from their mistakes. Do you think, um, as a filmmaker, well, first of all, as a filmmaker, 
what excites you most about the future of filmmaking in this world where the audience is part of the ecosystem now, active part of the ecosystem? Um, I think that it, the fact that um, that stories now are evolving of how do you, because I don't think this is for every story. I mean, there's the classic beginning, middle, and end. Of course, you want that for, for every, but for certain things, suddenly it's not about a story. You're building a world. You're building an experience that people can play in and, and join in on and, uh, and participate and, and have it grow into something totally different. Um, I, I think that that's, that's really, really exciting to be able to, uh, to, to tell story in that way where you set up a world and then the, and the characters sort of grow, grow out of that. Um, and also that, that, that young people can also uh, start to create stories without having a studio, without having all the stuff that I eventually was able to get but uh, but no, in the beginning you you didn't have those resources that you could start a story uh, on YouTube right now, and if it's good, it'll it'll click and people will watch it. If it's compelling, people will follow it. Um, and I think that's I think the idea that it's going to be the new reading and writing to to know audiovisual grammar I think is important. I think it's important education. I think that's what's going to uh, you know as young people start to learn more and more about it, it's going to be it's going it's an extremely empowering uh, idea. So. When you look at my, my last question is, um, you just mentioned, it's kind of like money is not the barrier, is it? Because everybody says, oh, I've got to raise money, I've got to get enough money, I've got to get financing. Yeah. Um, and you know, these days, it's, it's actually, there's a phrase, growth before revenue, which you pick up from Jeff Jarvis and what would Google do. But that's really what you did. You went to create before you worried about the money. Yeah. So what would you tell young filmmakers if they think money is the b obstacle? Well, I mean, money's always an obstacle because you got to get stuff. But at the same time, um, I, I had some great advice saying, if you're as creative as you are to get the movie made, as you are when you make the movie, you can do anything. That you can literally... Uh, you cameras are available on your phone. You can shoot something, and and if it's, you know, if it's compelling enough, if the story is uh, at the core of it, your stories and characters interesting, it can it can pop. Um, but you do have to be, uh, you know, you have to figure it out. You do have to uh, be a little agile in there and be just as creative to figure it out. Um, so well, you clearly have led the way in figuring it out, John. Congratulations on the Pioneer Prize. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, all right. We, um, I, I was watching the clock. Can you please tell us your name and where you're from? We'll be able to pick up your native language. Of course. I'm Stuart Dredge from the MIP blog. Um, I noticed you kind of got a tablet with you, and I was wondering how you see those kind of devices for, for interacting with this content and creating content. Um, well, it's been fun because, like, even um, even when we were we were uh, making the Bieber movie, we were able to talk to our audience while they're watching the movie. So take pictures of the guy in the red hat in this scene and send it to us and we'll send you a poster. Or like um, here, you know, we, we asked people to bring uh, glow sticks for the first weekend and if you didn't have a glow stick, I made a little uh, a JPEG with a glow stick uh, and you could just download it on your phone or on your iPad or whatever and bring it to the movie theater. And we went to the movie theater and people had it. Um, that direct contact, the uh, fact that they have uh, a, a a thing in their pocket that we can we can feed live information to is is pretty awesome. I think you know when you watch a movie the first time you can watch the movie and then maybe the second weekend you put in your earphones and it syncs up with the with the with the movie uh, from the sound and then also you get a director's commentary or actor's commentary while you watch it. Theater owners will probably hate that, but it's Not interesting. They come back to watch the movie the second time. Exactly, it changes the layers. I think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, this is Amit Dev from India. I'm a speaker on mobility. Uh, I have been hearing so much of technology in this. So is the effect that you have achieved, is the result driven more by technology and less by the content and creativity? Or what is the balance between these two in your final impact or the result? Have you looked at it? Like you have uh, recorded the people's opinion uh. from the first few days screening. Were they awed by the technology or they were floored by the content? Uh, are you asking for me personally? Um, for me personally, I grew up in the Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, so I grew up with technology. So naturally, I just it has empowered me to be able to do stuff. I'm not a great drawer. I'm not a great uh, music guy. But when I have a computer, I can put it together, and I know I can. I, I that's something that's connected to my brain. Um, and so, uh, so it's all it, technology is just a part of me. But the story has to be number one for sure. And when I, how do I, how would I tell this story? For some reason, technology and music 
just is is just a part of my language so we i it naturally goes there i guess uh, but it always to me it's always about story uh, and character number one does anyone else have any other questions oh there's one back there i'll grab it Uh, hi, I'm wondering whether you've ever considered um, some of the crossover kinds of experiences between film and gaming, and a lot of the social interaction that's going on also happens in game systems and people come together. Curious what you think about some of those kinds of transformations. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard because I'm, I'm torn, to be honest, because I'm used to the idea that I want to be the guy that guides you through the haunted house and shows you behind one curtain and then shows you passes you into darkness so you can't really look, but you create your own thing. I like, as a filmmaker that's and a storyteller, that's what I love the best. In gaming, it's hard because they you build a world and they go and they explore, and you're like, no, don't. But I mean, I guess they have a certain amount of control. It's just, for me, I'm, I don't know if I would be good at creating a gaming experience, to be honest. So You had said uh, to me that, you know, we talked about the, the longer you move into more audience participation, the less control that the storyteller has. And John loves creating the world that you can go into and inhabit, but not giving the control of the world over. Yeah, maybe that's my own issues, but <laughs> uh, I think it's a different part of the brain, to be honest, because I actually don't really understand how I can be good at that. Um, well, I would say um, control freak, but it, but we it would be tweeted, and we you know that to happen. So, <laughs> John, thank you so much thank for you. being here today. Congratulations again, and thank you guys for being here, and thanks for your questions, and thank you, Gavin. Thank you.